Mindful Mastery is balancing self-awareness and self-discovery on the one hand with skillfulness and, a, dare I say, self-discipline on the other hand. That was Dr. Laura Fielding on Psychologists Off the Clock. Curious what psychologists chat about over coffee? We are three clinical psychologists who love to discuss the best ideas from psychology. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. And from coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. In this podcast, we explore the psychological principles that we use in our clinical work. And we bring you ideas from psychology that can help you flourish in your work, parenting, relationships, and health. Thank you for listening to Psychologist Off the Clock. Hi, everyone. This is Debbie. Yael and I are here today to introduce an interview that I did with Dr. Laura Fielding. She has recently released a book called Mastering Adulthood, Go Beyond Adulting to Become an Emotional Grown-Up. And this is a book that's really geared toward people who are kind of in young adulthood, like just starting out their adult lives. Um, And it really brings in a lot of principles from some evidence-based behavioral therapies like acceptance and commitment therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy, just to help people who are going through some of the ups and downs of early adulthood um, to, like she says, become an emotional grown-up. And to me, I think that there can be a lot of ups and downs in this particular, you know, young adult time of life. It can be a really exciting time to explore values and decide, you know, where you want to head in life. And it can also have its challenges. Yeah, I mean, young adulthood is is such a wonderful and rich, but also difficult time because, you know, the developmental responsibilities of being a young adult are to explore who you are and what's important to you and to be developing all sorts of skills that will be used for the rest of your life. Um, But in that time, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of, um, you know, interest in taking risks and sort of learning more about yourself. And so I think having that clarity about, uh, you know, a willingness to explore what you value and what goals are important to you and how it is that you want to take the journey of life um, can be difficult. But I think, um, you know, having some of the skills that Dr. Laura Fielding talks about can really be, make it a lot easier to take that journey. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed this interview. She really does offer some ideas, some wonderful metaphors, and even shares a little about about her own personal journey. And so I hope, I think it's a really great interview and I hope you enjoy it. Dr. Laura Fielding is a clinical psychologist in California, specializing in the mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapies. She studied the psychophysiology of stress and emotions at the University of California, Los Angeles, and at Harvard, before getting her doctorate at Pepperdine University Graduate School of Education and Psychology, where she is an adjunct professor. Her recently released book is called Mastering Adulthood, Go Beyond Adulting to Become an Emotional Grown-Up. Dr. Fielding, congratulations on your wonderful new book, um, and thank you so much for joining us on Psychologists Off the Clock today. Oh my gosh, it's such my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, and I love your show, so I'm extra excited to be here. Uh, Well, thank you. It was really nice when um, we met each other in Montreal at the ACBS conference, and we sort of pieced this together and came up with the idea of doing the interview. I was I've been excited ever since. So happy the book is coming out. And um, just for, for folks who are interested, this is this book is really a very practical book. I think people will find it applies to all sorts of areas of life. And it's really based on evidence-based ideas from clinical psychology. So it's very much grounded in the clinical research. Um, and people will find it really applicable. I know I did. I'm, I'm a little bit past the young adulthood phase at this point, but I still found it really useful and helpful. I'm so glad. You know, the funny thing is it's almost, um, it's almost an r- ongoing joke around here now because every time I do a little description of the book when it's coming out, it doesn't matter what the age of the person, the same, it's almost the same words come out of their mouth. I need that. 
<laughs> so, and every time they do, it makes me super thrilled. So it's really, yes, while it's written for this transitional age kind of time, it, we're always in transition. We're always mastering adulthood and trying to figure out how to be a little bit more nuanced and complex and figure out who we are on the inside. So it applies to everybody whether it's a lay person or even clinicians who my students and other clinicians are finding that it's really helpful um, with fleshing out some ideas that they had thought about, but never really put it quite in the way I put it. So I'm happy yeah, that it's helping exactly. people. Well, and I was joking with um, my husband last night as I was, I was sort of doing the dishes and, you know, it was one of those kind of boring adult kind of days full of responsibility. And I was saying, you know, I'm doing this interview tomorrow and the book is about, you know, for young adults and the word adulting is the title. And I said, sometimes I feel like I'm still trying to figure out adulting. Yeah. There's a lot to it. And, and your book is about going beyond adulting. Yeah. And beyond doing dishes beyond, you know, I look at it this way. It's beyond just putting out the fires that life throws at you, which I certainly know my life started that way. Like, okay, here we go. And I'm just reacting. And I think as we're getting older and especially the wonderful thing about young generations now is they have these options, right. To really craft their lives and make decisions, which can be overwhelming and daunting. But if you have some of these tools, you know, from Steve Hayes and Marsha Linehan of, of identifying your values and your life worth living goals and things like that, then you can kind of reverse engineer uh, the landscape of what you want your life to look like. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So we were just talking before the interview started about how we both feel that it's really important to share a bit about our personal stories that kind of humanizes us. We're human too. We're all in the same soup. And in your book, you write a little bit about your own experiences mm -hmm. in young adulthood. I wonder if you could tell our listeners a little bit about your own journey and how you got here into this, this field of work. <laughs> sure, with pleasure. You know, I know that it's not traditional to share and to use what we call self-disclosure as therapists. And a lot of a lot of us feel really uncomfortable with it, but I think it's very important, as I mentioned to you before our interview started, that one of the common elements in the evidence-supported mindfulness treatments is this um, leveling of the playing field, that we're all in the human soup together. So my own story is I've kind of been adulting since I was 15. I left home in sort of a not very uh, stable or happy home environment with my sister to go start modeling when I was 15 in Paris and sort of on my own alone and looking around uh, not so safe environment. For me, it was really watching uh, people I loved and cared about, in particular my sister, making choices that I didn't understand and that were clearly detrimental to their well-being um, and then reflecting on, okay, what, how do I avoid that? How do I not make those same mistakes? And I came to school because I knew that I was very interested in health behavior and exercise and nutrition and, and um, various degrees of self-care and what I called back then self-preservation. Um, and uh, I, quite honestly, I was terrified that I'd lose my mental footing too. So um, as I went back to school at first, at, I, as a high school dropout, I went to sit Santa Monica City College, and I started getting A's. I was like, oh, well, maybe, it, first of all, maybe I'm not a dumb blonde after all. Maybe I can figure this out. Um, and I started to see that there was some growing bodies of research that showed that our self-care was a real moderator of uh, how stress impacts mental health. Um, so we could dive deep into that, all of that research. But that's why this is such an important topic for me, because um, what we know in those psychological processes that a trigger um, uh, compels an action tendency and emotion and, and, and thoughts, we know all of that. If we could share that with the public, right, that, that we could teach people how to recognize um, those pushes and pulls, whether it's to, to binge all the cookies in, in the cupboard or to take a drug or to um, sleep with the wrong guy or all those things that add passengers to our roster, um, it was a course I couldn't correct for the people in my life that I loved. And so now when I, when someone calls me or a friend asks me a question, they're like, sorry, I don't mean to make you psychology, do psychology when it's not, when you're off the clock. I said, you know, I love it. I love when people ask me and I can be of some service to help people, um, make the best of the lives that they've been given. So yeah, so that's found, found your calling in life. 
And for sure. For did sure. You, you went back to school a bit later? I understand. <laughs> yes, wow. very late. Um, so I dropped out at 16 and I was, I was modeling for a long, long time. Always reading tons of self-help books, which is why this book is so important to me. And I, I, I was already past 30 when I went back to school. Um, and I actually, the, the funny story, I went to Santa Monica City College one day just to check it out. And the woman said, the woman at register said, uh, it's the last day to register. Do you want to? And I said, I can't. I'm a high school dropout. And she said, of course you can. You could get your GED while you're here. It was $11 a unit at that time. So it was, it, and I'm eternally grateful and they will definitely be in my will, um, <laughs> for the encouragement and support they gave me and along the whole process and transferring me over to UCLA. And so it's been an amazing journey and I'm so grateful. And now you have your doctorate. And I mean, I think that's such an inspiring tale for people who start to feel like, oh, if, you know, it's too late or I haven't figured this out yet, that, but that there is always, you know, that possibility to, to, to find your calling. So important. And, and my clients definitely feel that way when I share that with them. When I see, you know, 27, 28 year olds and they're like, oh God, I've blown it. You know, I should know what I'm doing. And I tell them my story. It, they really find it inspiring and hopeful and they, you know, we live in a time where you can, you can shift gears just about any time. It's not always easy. You know, it's not easy to sort of go from one life to then, you know, okay, I'm going to not make any money and hunker down for 10 years and do this thing. Um, but if you find, that's the whole thing about finding what you value and finding what you care deeply about, because then you have the energy to pursue it. So I hope that I can inspire some people to yeah, find their true calling too. Yeah. And so, so speaking of young adults, your book is really geared toward young adults. And I know you do a lot of work with young adults in your practice. Can you tell us in your opinion, what are some of the challenges that are particularly likely for people to be facing at that particular stage of life? Well, I think it's not only that young adults have all, it's always been terrifying to enter into the vast unknown of adulthood, but the, what I call the road conditions right now are particularly daunting, right? So um, I, I think you might be a little younger than me, but when we were young, you know, we might have messed up in front of three or four people or five people or 10 people, but to mess up on the public stage, we know from, you know, old social psychology research that when you're just learning to do something and you do it in front of people, you do it less well. Um, but if you do, if you're an expert at it, then you know, then you'll do more well. So I think the challenges that young people are up against are the social comparisons and the overwhelming awareness of what's going on in the world and awareness that people are watching what they're doing in the world. Um, but th I think the decisions are the same. It's just the context that's changed a lot. It's just the, um, awareness of all the options of things they can do, the, the competition they sense because they see these perfectly curated images. And then having this uh, device in our hands creates that paradoxical thing with our experiential avoidance, right? They can use it to downregulate uh, stress in, in an immediate environment, but then there's more stress coming through that little thing. And like, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? Is it causing me pleasure or is it causing me... Um, discomfort. So absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's just so many different transitions happening on that age and that there's something going on culturally right now that even adds to that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. in making decisions about, you know, new relationships, do they like me? Do they not like me? Yeah. Uh, when we were dating, if a guy didn't call us or a girl didn't call us, you couldn't just jump on the computer and stalk them and find out right. where they are. You just sat when well, this is the key, right? You sat in the not knowing. Mm -hmm. And there's growing evidence that there's a, an increase of uncertainty and tolerance. The ability to just like say, I don't know. Yeah. So I think that's really what they're up against. Which has always been hard and painful, but it seems like now it's, there's a way to avoid it. Yeah, yeah. Th there's always a way to avoid it. I could catch myself. Like sometimes I'm staring at my phone. Why am I staring at my phone right now? Yeah. Um, I think we'll go to a trend. We saw a news story last night uh, about restaurants having little boxes on the table to put your phone in when you yeah. come to restaurants. I think that's going to be a growing trend. Uh, social media stars reported that they're taking a break. I think we'll start to see that it has to be um, introduced into our norm to take uh, uh, digital detox time. 
Yeah, we've actually talked about that a bit on the podcast in the past before that, you know, people can get so hooked on it. And it's so important to take breaks from it. And I think you're right, when I was young, this didn't, this technology didn't even exist. And the perception I have is that that's certainly added some challenges. I, I think that it seems like young people today are under a lot of pressure. Oh, yeah, that's just my perception. But that's how it seems to me. There is because in a way, um, the abundance that that we enjoyed in the 80s, 90s, you know, so when they were just growing up, there was a wonderful interview with a journalist, um, Bill Maher or something, and she said, you know, the 80s and 90s was like a bubble of this utopian time, right, where we weren't at war, really, we were safe, we were, the stock markets were booming, our parents were happy, and so we, so my generation instilled in younger generations is sort of utopian ideal about they should be happy. They shouldn't have to worry. And, and now things have changed and there's so much of technology in their face that, yeah, that they're not as well equipped as they might've been. So it's both the historical context that it's sort of predisposed the low distress tolerance, as well as really objective stressors in the environment. Um, making it really tough. And it's not just, it's really, I mean, if you think about it, I had a a Blackberry just seven years ago. So it's really very recent that this explosion of social media has been going on. Yeah. Or smartphone is, you know, it's impossible not to have one pretty much. Yeah. You you can barely remember not having one. Yeah. 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 It's funny. I feel like we're two old fogies sitting here talking about things. Yeah, back in the day when we had to actually find a payphone. <laughs> <laughs> we're dating ourselves. <laughs> yeah. So, so one thing again that I love about the book is that you really, again, you draw from the evidence-based clinical approaches, things like acceptance and commitment therapy, dialectical behavior therapy, these wonderful approaches. Um, and you, you give some helpful ideas for young people who are struggling with these kinds of things. Um, So let's kind of move into that, some of the clinical bits. Um, So, and, you know, again, it's sort of self-help in the sense that it's not just if you have a, you know, a clinical disorder per se, but just life struggles that we all have. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so the the book is, I really intentionally wrote the book in a way that balanced and again, normalized the ubiquity of human experience. And you know, some of my early young readers said, oh my gosh, I love this. You didn't make me feel bad for having anxiety or like something was wrong with me. And for people to understand that two different people can experience the exact same facts in very different ways. And much like we have We've recognized that we have to increase cultural tolerance, understanding that different experiences of the same facts does not mean there's something wrong or broken with the person. And I loved that my early readers read it and said, I, for the first time I read a self-help book and didn't feel bad about myself. And so you were asking earlier whether the book was for a particular diagnosis or just life satisfaction, and it's across the gamut. It's really just aiming at helping us be good in our humanness in a way. I love that. I love that. And I, and I agree. I think some self-help books, you're like, well, okay, I should be more like this or that, but yours is much more validating of, you know, we all have emotions. We all have thoughts. We all have behavior patterns that aren't great for us. And, and you work on helping people with those, but at the same time, just normalizing them. Yeah. And you know, the funny thing is it's, it's a tough sell, right? I'm writing a blog right now that's trying to sort of get this idea of, um, uh, habituated in people that we all have a thing, right? We all have a pattern of behavior that gets in our way. And then if we can sort of drop the shame and drop the facade that like, I don't have a thing, I'm just good. Mm-hmm. If we could all drop that um, baloney, <laughs> um, then maybe we could all sort of say like, yeah, that's my thing. I, I kind of know, because we all know people who, you know, we have friends that go, oh, that's just so like, Michelle, or that's just so like Robert or what, and we have those things, but if we could just own it, not only would we be more psychologically flexible, but our friends would be more understanding. And I know for sure when I'm in, uh, in Lara mode <laughs> and I'm either pushing someone too hard and I'll say this to clients, actually, I'll, I'll say just FYI, my thing is that I get a little overexcited, I get a little eager, and then I start pushing a little too hard and then I can be annoying. So I'm just 
warning you now that I will own it when it happens. <laughs> that's your thing. That's my thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what the book is helping is trying to help people own their thing. Um, but it's a hard sell because I'm not saying, Hey, let's look at how awesome you are and give you a trophy. Let's actually, um, take a look at, um, where you might be contributing a little bit to some of the difficulties in your life and getting in your own way. Yeah. I like it. Let's get real people. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So one metaphor I love in your book is there are actually several, you have some great metaphors. One is this idea of the castle and the village metaphor in terms of how we respond to emotions in different ways. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? A hundred percent. So the castle and village metaphor, I developed it over time in my private practice as I started to notice that there was sort of a continuum or, or two very distinct patterns that were showing up and then variations along a continuum. Um, on the one hand, being a DBT practitioner, I saw a lot of the classic signs of emotion dysregulation where there was an under-regulation. There was the highs, the lows, the love, the hates. If you've ever um, treated someone with a classic diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, you might have experienced this, that they could be so interesting and so smart and charming and connected and they love hard and they hate hard and they fight and they make up, but they are authentic and anything that like reeks of like, I'm just putting on my therapist's face and talking to you, that they will just call you out right? because <laughs> they are so connected. Well, this obviously can cause a lot of the chaos in their life. So that's what I started to call the village person. The flip side of that is what I call the castle person, where it's almost like what we call in DBT a parent competence. You're trying to appear like you've got your stuff all together. All the bricks are in order. Your life looks really great, but you have a little less flexibility. It's hard for you to reflect inward on what you care deeply about because you've sort of blocked up all your emotions. Um, it also makes empathy pretty difficult because you, you know, you've the idea is sort of like, I've got my stuff together. You need to keep that mess to yourself as well. Um, so the funny thing is, is as I developed this metaphor over time, I started to delve into the research a little bit. And there's actually some personality research that actually describes exactly the same thing. And while the descriptions and science of this are personality disorders, I as you can tell, I'm not a big fan of diagnostic labels. Um, what we're describing as a village person is more like towards the borderline um, dysregulated, under emotion regulated. And then there's sort of overregulated with sort of like more of a narcissistic or OCPD kind of presentation. Um, and uh, the aim of the book is to sort of start with that um, polarization and descriptions thereof to sort of say, am I more, do I t- tend to go into more castle mode or more village mode? And then chapter 11 talks about how castlers and villagers tend to cohabitate a lot mm-hmm. and hook up a lot. Um, but my clients love it and people tend to really like it because it's a little bit like an astrological horoscope. It's like, oh my God, I'm totally castling out right now. And you can start, it, it gives an entry point for um, getting to that place we talked about a moment ago about owning your stuff and knowing when you're doing your thing. Yeah. And thinking about for yourself, what's working, what's not working about that and where you sort of fall on that continuum, you know, are you more sort of guarded and inflexible or are you more dysregulated? And, and if so, how's that playing out in your life and how can you work on I'm making that work for you, right? Yeah, you know, it's really, it, exactly. It, it, and it's so, because we think about, you know, our human mind chunks information in ways. And when you have this sort of like, oh, I'm this, or I'm a type A or I'm a type B kind of thing, it makes it easier to start to chip away at the, that huge complexity that the book yeah. continues to dive into. Um, and I've often thought, and people have asked me, are you, a, so are you a castle or a village person? And, you know, it's very funny because, you know, raised by, you know, a, you know, wacky family of a Russian mom who was, who was a tarot card reading, seance holding, like, woo, in the valley in the seventies. I feel like I'm a, I know I'm a feeler. I'm a deeply sensitive person. So I thought I was more like a villager, but then I thought, oh, a parent competence trying to show that I'm okay. I'm good enough. Can and I play with you? I, I want to, I want to, people to like me is more like my castle side. And really the trick and the beauty of this simple metaphor is that we need to castle up sometimes. And so when we're adulting, if you go to your job, you need to kind of put on your castle mask. I hear young people that I work with in social media and stuff. They say, I want to be a hundred percent um, accepted for my authentic self. And I want my boss to see me for who I am. And I'm not so sure that that's actually context appropriate. Right. So sometimes we do need to pull up the castle wall 
And sometimes we need to throw down the moat and go into the village and connect. Maybe go have drinks with your colleagues and, or, you know, eat with your colleagues so you can connect in that way. But I think the metaphor is maps on nicely to psychological flexibility of knowing when to pull up the wall and when to, to, you know, run naked through the village. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think that's really true. There are some contexts in which one might work a little better than the other. And that's, exactly. that's an important <laughs> distinction there. Yeah. 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 And another great metaphor that you have that kind of weaves, I think, throughout the book quite a bit um, is this idea of the mind body vehicle and the passengers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that one. So that metaphor takes us a little a level deeper, right? So we start with this sort of, you know, all or none bifurcated um, example of the castle in the village. And then, and I actually thought about making it like a little video game where you have like a little car leave the village or something. Um, the mind body vehicle is basically Stephen Hayes's passengers on the bus metaphor. Um, but I added to, to really, for me, I felt like if you want to lock into the biopsychosocial model, really nicely that you would add the importance of the physical health of our bodies and that we all live in a machine called this body for listeners who are listening. Now you can really connect to this awareness that you could feel your butt in the chair. You're hearing sounds from your ears and that we're behind our own face, that each vehicle is unique, that we all have different genetics and biological characteristics, but just like cars are very, very different from electric cars to SUVs to vintage Aston Martins. They all have the same three main components. So just like a car has an engine, a steering wheel and tires we all have emotions, thoughts, and action tendencies or action impulses. And uh, so I use the mind-body vehicle metaphor to highlight the first section of the book, which is called Universal You, that we are all in the human soup together. We can drop our defensiveness because this, these rule, laws of nature, if you will, apply to all of us. I don't care how special you are. We all have emotions, thoughts, action tendencies that get triggered from events outside the road. And I think that you know, thinking about this machine that you live in as a vehicle, and we, most of us know the experience of being in a vehicle or in a car, and that the potholes and detours in the road of life are causing your vehicle to react in a particular way. So the vehicle part lends itself to biology and biological predispositions. So if you're a more sensitive kind of vehicle, you might need a little more self-care. If you're a more hardy, durable SUV kind of vehicle, you might have more blind spots and not be able to see the needs of more delicate cars. And so it really gives this nuance about um, recognizing that your experience inside the vehicle is something different than the facts outside the vehicle. And then, and then of course, then from that part of mind body vehicle in chapter two, I dive into the classic passengers on board who have you collected from your past experience, the good days, the bad days, the holidays, the special days and rec starting to take roll call. And that's the first, um, that's the first video exercise that I have, which I'm sure we'll talk about where I guide um, the user to start taking emotional roll call. Like who's on board and how can I get better at taking care of the kids on, on board my vehicle? Mm -hmm. And, and driving your vehicle where you want to go, which leads us yes, to exactly yeah, <laughs> to something really important in young adulthood, I think, which is figuring out where you want to go and figuring out the direction you want to take in life. Cause to me, that's my developmental psychology background in graduate school. You know, you talk a lot about during those years of trying to figure out What's important to you? What do you want out of life? Which direction do you want to head? How do you help young people in your practice and in your book, mm -hmm. that, you know, figuring that out, figuring out what direction to head in life? I don't know about you, but I think values work is, at least for me, it's the hardest part. And chapter six was a bear, man, to write that. Um, I was, <laughs> listen, my room, I might have called you. <laughs> help. <laughs> um, uh, it's helping young people figure out what they want to do. You, I come up against a couple of barriers, first of all, right? So there's the traditional quarter life crisis that, and there's that uncertainty, like how do I identify it? So with my castle um, clients, they're, they're so disconnected and they've learned how to shut down their emotions so well that they don't know how to, as Stephen Hayes says, hurt where they care and care where they hurt. So the objective for a castle person is to help them tap into the emotional aspects and what does make them feel and let themselves start feeling so that they can 
start to recognize what they care about. Um, so broadly speaking, a castle would be more start with emotion, start with something like an exercise of like even the sim if they're really guarded um listening to music what songs make you feel something deeply finding things that really connect them to those deeper feelings and then uh deconstructing the messages of those emotions okay if this met if this helps you feel anger what do you, what pisses you off if it pisses you off you must care about it um and then with my more underregulated sort of anxious or depressed sort of clients um i help them by doing some of the more classic visualizing success um or visualizing your funeral so i've changed it to visualizing success in the book um in the spirit of again i this book is not just about controlling symptoms it's about growing your life so I don't know if you've ever noticed this in your own life when you visualize something you really want, maybe something for the podcast or something for your career or, or a career change you want to make. With the minute you picture that, as much as you want it, a little something uncomfortable starts to tingle in you, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I definitely know this in my life. Anytime I've visualized you know, big things happening, we get a little, we just tense and yeah. like the passengers start to stand up. And I make this point repeatedly in the book that the minute you think about something you truly want, by definition, passengers are going to show up. Insecurities, yeah. doubt, anxiety. Um, this was an interesting story once with a young girl I was working with. Um, and she was an actress, but I rewrote her into one of the, um, one of the uh, storylines in the book. Um, we visualized her, hitting the apex of her career. She wanted to be an actress. I had her visualize being on set. And I thought this would help motivate her. But she started to cry. And so we went, continued the exercise. And when she opened her eyes, I asked her, what happened? She said, I realize I'm so sad because I'm not there yet. And can you see how if I'm visualizing a map, right, of a successful point and then sadness shows up, what's the action tendency of sadness? Withdraw shut down, try to make yourself feel better. So we need to start using her skills to transcend through the sadness, right? And while using it as a sort of, I'll say a negative reinforcer, like that if she, like to move forward in her career, she could lower that sadness kind of a thing. So the question is, how do you connect um, young people to their values? You have to use that emotional component and somehow you have to either get at it or you have to find out how the emotional component is blocking the action tendency. So I do that through a variety of, of the traditional ways that we do it and act or, um, or some of the ways I describe in my book where I have them actually start to expose themselves using some exposure to expose them to the emotions that might actually drive them yeah. towards what they want. I mean, I think that's so wonderful. There's when you really think about what matters to you, there's nothing more terrifying than thinking about, you know, what if, what if I put all my heart and soul into that and then it doesn't happen. But, but you, to really live the life you want to live, you have to be willing to have some of that. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. You have to be willing to have that. You have to be willing to sit with uncertainty. Um, you know, and the kind of neat thing about this generation is that they are, there's a lot, at least in the ones that I follow on social media and stuff, I see there's a lot more chatter about failing forward and being open to that and, and like sharing your failures and uh, one cute little um, Instagram page that I followed that is called Half the Story where they talk about, here's what you don't see on my thing. So they're getting more granular and three-dimensional about sharing themselves. So that is kind of a cool thing about today's time, but that's what we have to practice too and to guide our clients to do that. And uh, I hope this conversation will trigger you to start visualizing, to practice that video that I sent to you from that's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> it's in yeah. chapter six. And we can link to some of your resources on the show notes. So for people, oh, who, that'd be great. Yeah. Who want to find your book and find some of these resources. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think that's that gives me some hope to think that people are starting to to acknowledge that more and more. And I think I'm glad that, that you're doing your part today on the podcast and with your book. <laughs> me too. Me too. It does. That's my my optimistic vision of the future. That sometimes when things get really bad in our environment, that you know we rebel by saying, you know, by pushing for these more idealistic notions. And I think if there is, I often say, if there is an evolutionary hurdle that is our next move, it is consciousness, 
right? It is recognizing the virtual reality that this mind-body vehicle creates for us that distorts what's actually happening on the road and that if we can sort of build that observer self in ourselves, um, that we could all be more intentional and kind and, and yeah. nurturing for each other. I love that. I love that. And then, you know, in the book, you set the stage with all of these, you know, these metaphors and these ideas, and then you move into some really specific skills for people. (laughs) And I I mean, I wish we had time to go over all of them, but just kind of an overview, you talk about sort of checking your thoughts, skills, you talk about things like validation and self-compassion, change, self-care, relationship skills. I think I really could have used some of these at, at the young adult stage. So I really appreciate them. And, and I think people will find them really helpful. I was wondering if you could maybe just give a couple of examples of some of the skills that you think are most helpful for young adults. I absolutely can. And the the idea of the book is to give you like a recipe book for building your life, right? So as I said, it starts with universal you, unique you is the second part. So they deconstruct, you know, how is my pattern showing up and, you know, getting in the way of my goals. And now we're talking about the skillful you, which is part three. And skillful you is broken down into three chapters, which is, I've sort of condensed the hexaflex um, to the basic CBT triangle of emotions, thoughts, actions. And simplified it for my clients that there's basically three steps for emotional self-care and each one of those chapters has you know a whole bunch of ways of drilling down and practicing them but basically so chapter eight is the valid how to validate your emotions it's exposure it's traditional exposure techniques it's um willingness hands from dbt ways to open up and use your body with what either a quick willingness hands exercise. So just opening palms up, shoulders down, belly out is a way to send a message to your mind that you're open to your experience and not fighting what is. Um, I also have in there um, body scan audio and different ways to get at through the body being open and willing with emotions. Chapter nine is the keep your thoughts in check, redirect attention to the present moment, recognize thoughts as thoughts, not facts. And then chapter 10 is asserting the control where we do have control, which is in our actions. And that is, um, there are some um, quick hacks from DVT, like ice on the forehead if you're having a panic attack or um, paced breathing, slowing your breath down to regulate the autonomic nervous system. Um, and then there are, there, I have a lot, a pretty substantial section on um, health behavior because as I mentioned earlier, that was my early interest and my master's degree at Harvard was actually in the psychophysiology of stress and how health behavior affects that. So I go through some of the ways that if if we're not, if we don't have a healthy body, you're going to have a lot harder time keeping your mind healthy. We know from the microbiome research that, you know, we have a second brain in our gut. Um, So the way I tried to map it out in the book was that with these three simple steps of validate, check, change, and in there I have one small blip that I call it the mindfulness macarena. So people listening at home, if they're sitting at home, they can imagine putting both hands in self-compassion on the chest, validate your emotions, fingers on your temples, check your thoughts, and then two handguns forward, change your behavior is And that's how I get my clients to memorize like, oh God, I'm freaking out. What do I do? Okay. Okay. I can label my emotion. I talk about labeling emotions a lot in the book because there's such great research on the power of labeling your emotions. Um, And so that's, those are those steps. And then the next chapter after that is how to start using the skills you just learned for yourself to apply your relationships and building stronger relationships with the emotional experiences of your partners and friends and loved ones. So that's sort of how I tried to make it like a recipe book that you could really go back and build your own adventure kind of thing um, so that it's really customizable, this book. It's not just for any particular presentation. Yeah, it kind of covers it all. And I feel like you can use these skills in so many different ways in different contexts, different situations in your life. Um, as I was thinking and I was trying to imagine, I mean, these are applicable, of course, throughout the lifespan, but I was imagining myself, you know, in my early 20s and thinking, which one would I have really benefited the most? And I think it's the kind of checking your thoughts, keeping your thoughts in check one, because I feel like I was so caught up in all kinds of stuff 
and I didn't have the awareness that oh, oh, here's my mind doing this thing. And I think, oh, I wish I would have read this <laughs> chapter. <of that. laughs> yeah, I think I think there's you know in you know in acceptance and commitment therapy, our ultimate aim is the psychological flexibility and the ability to not use any control strategies. But in, at the last ACBS conference, there was a lot of discussion about like when are change strategies sometimes helpful and is there a place for them in acceptance and commitment therapy? I gotta say, I think when we're young um, and we're still learning the rules of life, you know, rule governed behavior, the mantra is in act that rule governed behavior is rigid and it's less permeable to new information. And that's true. I do think for like adolescents and young adults, though, starting with a rule and then knowing how to break it. Um, is really helpful. It's my Picasso analogy. Picasso was a finely trained artist who went to the best and he knew how to draw exact renditions of, of reality. And then once he learned that, he could break all the rules and create something amazing. And I think that in our psychological life, uh, it's a little helpful to know some rules to anchor yourself on. And that's kind of what this book tries to roadmap out. Like, here's the laws of nature of how your mind-body vehicle works. Yeah, that's a good metaphor for Picasso. I mean, I think I do think that there are times when we can follow rules that can be very helpful. And yeah, like drive on the right side of the street yeah. here and drive on the left side yeah. other places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then maybe sometimes we need to bend them or flex them, but to to kind of start by by with a, a roadmap is is a great place to start. I think so. I think yeah. So. And so to finally kind of wrap up the you you sort of end with this idea of mindfulness mastery. And I think that's the name of your clinical practice. As yes, well, right? exactly. Mindful mastery. I love it. It sort of encompasses all of the above that we've talked about today. What, what do you mean by mindful mastery? And, and I know you have some ways, some exercises people can do to kind of get there. Right. So the skills in the book, the skills in the book are mindful mastery skills. Mindful mastery, just to define, mindful mastery is what I call my practice. It highlights the dialectic of acceptance and change. We're mindful, we're open, and we're masterful, we're controlled. We're... So it's trying to highlight that dialectic. And mindful mastery is based on uh, what I found in my research and was replicated with my student and now associate, uh, Dr. Koshamba, um, as these seven common elements of ACT, DBT, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based eating, and the mindfulness um, relapse prevention. Um, And so the underlying themes are always balancing acceptance and change, um, uh, maintaining and eliciting commitments with your clients. So there's a whole, uh, there's a list of seven different common elements that the whole book is based on, that my work is based on. But where it ties into in the book is this idea that when we're mindful of our individual unique programming and what I call autopilot patterns, right? Uh, that's the mindful part. Then we can and then build mastery in these kind of mindfulness exposure based CBT kind of skills that then we become a mindful master. And the book offers at the very end uh, a handout that I would used to make with my clients in session. That's how I developed it. Is okay. What is the pattern we identified? Oh, I identified that in these situations. And then we put that at the top. I get triggered, and I have, and I start worrying about my performance, which makes me anxious, which makes me shut down, or whatever your pattern is. And then, and then in the book, you can link them to the mindfulness skills from the various chapters that work best for you. And then you have your own little tool right there of mindful mastery of how you can balance those two things. And I'll I'll add that one thing we didn't tap into too much was the book teaches the reader how to do their own, what we know is called a functional analysis with these dashboard forms that they collect. And, and there's a video of how to identify your own patterns and start to recognize what's showing up a lot for you. Um, so mindful mastery is balancing self-awareness and self-discovery on the one hand with skillfulness and a, dare I say self-discipline on the other hand. Yeah, that's such a great thing to aim for, I think, is to have that nice balance between acceptance, awareness, and then doing what works in your life to kind of get you where you want to be. So that's, yeah. And your book is a lovely balance of those concepts and presented in a way that I think people will enjoy reading and find really helpful. 
So I, I, I really hope so. <laughs> I so appreciate, I mean, congratulations on your book. What an accomplishment. I think it'll help a lot of people. And thank you so much for, for joining us. I wonder if we could end by, um, so, so again, the book is called Mastering Adulthood, Go Beyond Adulting to Become an Emotional Grown-Up. And can you give us some information about how people can find you online or contact you if they're, if they're interested? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, they can find us at, the, at our website, mindful-mastery.com. And on the, on the website, you'll find the, we're going to be releasing all the videos from the book, even if, whether you bought the book or not. But the book, of course, helps you tie it all together. I'm, of course, on lots of social media trying to spread the good word of psychology, um, at Mindful Mastery on Instagram and Twitter. And we have a uh, Facebook page as well. And if you get the book, uh, we are going to also be starting a private group, uh, a Mastering Adulthood group on Facebook. So where I'll drop in and my colleague, Dr. Koshan, will be dropping in. We'll be there to answer questions and every now and then have little live group chats and things. Um, so I'm pretty findable. Yeah, that sounds like it. That's it. <laughs> I love the Facebook idea. I'm on one like that. There's a closed group for a parenting thing that I, I like a training that I did and it's, it's oh, nice. a cool way to connect with people. Yeah. yeah. And like, yeah. And I think that if you have a place where people are all, it's a, a culture of this idea that we're all figuring it out together. And, um, I think it can really add a layer of support to, to the growth process and mastery adulthood that we're all doing. I love it. I love it. Well, it was a real pleasure talking with you today, Laura. Thank you so much for, thank you so time. much, Debbie. Really enjoyed it. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for listening to psychologists off the clock. You can find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you are having a mental health emergency, please dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources on our webpage. Our website is www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's www.offtheclockpsych.com.